We're thankful that you came to Chicopee today. Have you ever had just one of those weeks where you didn't know up from down or left from right? Anybody here have one of those weeks? Yes, I can understand I'm there with you today. But I'm reminded of something that Jesus told one of the disciples. Jesus was asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And and they said, some say that you're Elijah. Some say John. Or one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up. Peter's the big mouth in the group. Don't be elbowing your, your spouse right now. Peter was the big mouth that would always just open up and would be the first one to answer any question. So Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter said, why, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. And Jesus says something to him in chapter 16 of Matthew that's very interesting. That's not going to be our main text today, but I want to read this to you. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. The church is not the building. The church is not an organization. The church is people. The church is made of you and I. We are the church. Now, the church is not perfect because we're not perfect. Some of you in this room have probably had really bad experience with people at church. And so you think church is the place, the last place you want to go. But let me tell you, the best place to be if you're not perfect is in church. But here's the thing that strikes me. Jesus tells Peter... I am going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't know about you, but since I'm part of the church, sometimes I feel like I've been prevailed against. I've been overpowered, I've been overshadowed, I have been pushed down, I have been crushed. And I stand before you this week as your pastor, exhausted in mind, exhausted in spirit, exhausted in soul. But I can tell you this, it is well with my soul. I had planned to preach another sermon earlier in several weeks ago about what today would be about, but it just wouldn't work. And this week, I preached two funerals. My dad was in the hospital. He has heart failure on the right side, and it's not going to get better. The future does not look bright. Hopefully, he'll get to come home. There's just so much stuff that seems to overshadow and beat us down as the church, ladies and gentlemen. But Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So what do we do when we feel like we're overpowered? What do we do when we feel like we're beat down and we feel discouraged and we feel like we just cannot go on? I can tell you one thing. The evil one wants to hold you hostage to that. He wants to hold you hostage to a place where you will not break free and find the victory in Jesus. Jacob, today you could not have picked any better songs than what I needed. And to begin with this idea, there's victory in Jesus. Yes, there's victory in Jesus, but what happens when everything seems to be overwhelming you and victory seems so far away? Well, one of the things we're going to do today, which I think we should always do, that's go to God's Word and see what the Word says. Why go to church? Why is church important? Because the church is the place where we can overcome. I'm going to say that again because there's only one person in this room that seems to really believe that. 
The church is the place where we can come and we can realize that we can be overcomers. A few more of you heard me that time. You better stay dialed in today. I'm going to get you. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. It's near the end of the New Testament. It's a small little letter written by one of the, the disciples, actually, whose name is John. The beloved disciple who was really dear and close to Jesus that was there at the Last Supper, that was there at the cross, that was there at the tomb. John was an eyewitness of Jesus' life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. John is the only one who was not martyred by being killed for his faith. He was left on the Isle of Patmos and it was there that he got the revelation that we find is the last book of the New Testament, which we will be there before this sermon is over. I want us to look at chapter 5 of verse 1 John for a moment. Chapter 5 of, of 1 John, verse number 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. Let me tell you something, church. There's a promise in God's word that we have already overcome, but we struggle with that, don't we? We struggle because we don't understand that our experience should be equal to our legal status. But if our legal status says that we're overcomers, why is it that we feel so overcome by everything else? We need to match up our experience to our legal status. Now, let me put it to you this way. In other words... A person can be married, if you're married, say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I love it, if you're married. You can be married and not be happy. But just because you're not happy doesn't make you unmarried, does it? Thankfully, I'm not in that category. I'm a very happily married man. My wife rallies around me and helps me and supports me, and if not for her, I would not be the man that I am today. Now, you didn't have to say it that loud, Marty. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I agree. But you can be married legally and be unhappy. But even though you're unhappy, it doesn't mean you're not married. You can still be married. You can be a Christian and, and you can feel defeated, but that doesn't make you unchristian or less than a Christian if you feel overwhelmed. Do you, do you hear me, church? I don't want you to begin to think that if I'm not walking in victory and I'm not walking with my head up that I'm some kind of less of a Christian and I'm not good enough because that's not the case. Would you like some biblical proof of that? Revelation. And Jesus is talking to John and he's talking about seven different uh, churches and, and he says in chapter 2 verse 7, He who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. It's written in a way that the ones that overcome listen to what I'm about to say. And this is to the church. He also says the same thing in verse 11 of the same chapter. He who overcomes. Verse 17 of chapter 2. To him who overcomes. As if it is something that can be accomplished and some can and some cannot and there is a struggle with it. Verse 26. He who overcomes. Chapter 3, verse 5, he who overcomes. In verse 12 of chapter 3, Jesus says, he who overcomes. He is speaking to those who overcome. And he's speaking to the church. He's not directly speaking to those, everybody who's been born again. He's talking to those who are overcoming. So how do we reconcile this idea that in 1 John it says we have overcome. And then in Revelation, Jesus has said those who have overcome. How do we reconcile? It's because of this. We can be Christian and we can struggle with overcoming. But our legal status needs to match our experience. So how do we get there? Well, we have to understand that God does not always put that overcoming in our hand, but he puts it within our reach. 
when it comes to this idea of overcoming, the first thing I want you to write down is this thought that God will put it within our reach, but not necessarily in our hand. What does this mean? Well, let's go back to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Watch the words, our faith. Let me tell you something. Somebody get me an umbrella. Matt, would you get me an umbrella? I forgot to get an umbrella. I want a big umbrella. Somebody bring me an um umbrella. Oh, you're, yeah, my wife carries a small umbrella. But I want a big one to illustrate this point of our faith. You know, today it's supposed to rain. It rains. Sometimes the forecast says it's going to rain. Sometimes they say it's, it, it's going to storm. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. This one's actually even wet today. So apparently I would say, ladies and gentlemen, it must be raining outside. But I have this umbrella in my hand right now. What does this umbrella have the power to do? It has the power to shield me from the rain. It has the power. Now, if I walk outside and it's raining, what am I going to do? I'm going to get wet. My hair's going to get wet. My clothes are going to get wet. I'm going to get wet. The rain will overcome me if I don't have an umbrella. I can go outside with this umbrella and I could walk around just like this. I could walk around. I, I could use it as a, as a cane. I could use it like they do in singing in the rain as a little prop. Singing in the rain. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a clap on that one. But if I go outside in the rain and all I do is hold on to this umbrella and I never open it, I'm not accessing the overcoming power of this umbrella. You hear me, church? But if I go outside in the rain, yep, I'm going to do it. All those who are superstitious, you better understand, I believe Jesus is the one who defines what we do. Now, I go outside, and it might be raining, and if I put up this umbrella, guess what happens? There's an overcoming taking place in my life. An overcoming of the rain, no matter how hard it rains, it ain't going to get to me. Let me tell you something. We have access to the overcomer, and that is Jesus Christ. And we have to access that. He's within our reach. We have to stop using him like a crutch. Whoo, that was good. Somebody will write that one down. That wasn't even in my notes. Here's what we have to do. We have to begin to look at Jesus differently. We have to begin to look at Jesus differently to be an overcomer. We will not be able to overcome if all we see is rain. If all we see is the storm in our life. The only way that I'm up here today is because of Jesus. Because if it was left up to me, I would have gone somewhere on vacation, people. I was tired this week, exhausted. But I am here to testify to you. No matter the storm in your life and how hard it gets, we have an overcomer and his name is Jesus. He is not a decorative cross we hang around our neck, them knowing us and we just want it to be a status symbol and we may say, oh, I go to church. Yeah, I love Jesus. I'm about to make a bold statement. The Lord just laid this on my heart. Jesus will never be an overcomer in your life when you're ashamed of Him every day of your life. If you are ashamed and you hide Jesus, well, I don't want people to know that I know Him. I'll be persecuted. You can quote me on this. Oh, uh, wah. <laughs> because here's the thing. Jesus hung naked on a cross for you, for your sins, we should not be ashamed of Him in our life. He, give God the praise. He should be the one that we have at the forefront of our life. 
When we walk around, people are to look at us and go, whew, there's something different about you. And the first thing that comes out of our mouth, it should be, eh, it's because it's Jesus. Jesus is the one that makes the difference. I'm glad that I have Jesus in my life because I would not be an overcomer. I would be overwhelmed. I'd be, I'd be, there ain't no telling where I'd be right now. I might be on the street somewhere. I don't know, but because of Jesus, I can be an overcomer. I want us to look at Revelation chapter 12. You can turn to Revelation chapter 12. And while we turn there, I want you to keep in mind that Jesus says, Take heart, I have overcome the world. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, it says that he has disarmed the rulers of this age. I got to do something fun this week. Can I tell you about it? I got to go to a gun range and shoot a pistol. Thank you, Troy. <laughs> My friend Troy took me to the gun range, taught me all about guns, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. He taught me to shoot. If you come upon me and you got a gun, you're going to have control of my life. You tell me to sit down, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit down. You tell me to stand up, I'm going to stand up. You're going to have control over me if you got a gun in your hand. But let me tell you something. As soon as I find out your gun ain't got no bullets, We have bought the lie from the evil one that his gun is loaded and full of bullets. But he was defeated on the cross by Jesus Christ when he rose from the dead. Death, hell, and the grave no longer has victory. He does. Jesus is our healer. Jesus is our comforter. But yet we believe the enemy's gun is full of bullets. So what do we need to do? Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. This should get good. Revelation 12, verse 11. As it's referring to those who are overcoming the evil one. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. Whoo, somebody say amen. Because of the blood of the Lamb, they overcame. Let me tell you what that is. That's the cross, ladies and gentlemen. That is the cross. The power of overcoming is found in the cross. Not 2,000 years ago, but right now on May the 11th, 2019, it's the cross we find overcoming power. It's not something we refer to and think about that was ancient. It's something that's real right now in our lives. See, they overcame because they understood the cross at Calvary and the blood was not something that applied 2,000 years ago, but applies right now in their life. And until we see that, we will never overcome. The cross will give us the victory to overcome. Romans 8.37 says that we are more than conquerors. Let me ask a question. How do you become more than a conqueror? I thought conquering is about all you can do. Let me tell you, through Jesus Christ, He won't only do what you need, He will do even more than you need. He, we can be more than conquerors. The cross. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame Him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of of their testimony, their confession, ladies and gentlemen. Their confession. See, being a Christian is not a secret society. They confessed, they talked about what Jesus did in their life. When God does something big in your life, you need to put it on display somewhere in your life. It might be on your refrigerator, it might be in your office, it might be on your book bag, it, it could be in your car. And when people walk by and they see it, they need to go, what is that? And you need to tell them. Jesus showed up and he did something big in my life and I got victory. If you don't want other folks to know when you have been baptized and that you know Jesus, then don't be calling on Jesus when you're denying him. Today, 
You may be someone in this room whose storms, whose life, things are overwhelming you. But let me tell you something, your eyes need to be on Jesus. Just believing in God won't cut it. Just believing Jesus died on the cross won't cut it. It's an intense, absolute focus and relationship on Him. Confession. So we can see right here in verse 11 of Revelation 12, the cross, the confession. Let's read. And they overcame Him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, but do I have the commitment to love him more than I love my life itself? See, a love relationship that transcends death is a love relationship that will transcend circumstances of this life. When Jesus and that commitment to Him transcends whether I feel like going today or whether the, the, it's raining enough or not raining enough or maybe, maybe you know what, nah, we haven't just rested enough. I understand having to rest sometimes. I need to rest. We all need to rest. But the thing is, God created the church. That's plan A. He has no plan B. You need to be part of the church to be able to overcome and be encouraged because that's the place you can meet Jesus and other people and go, Jesus can make a difference. Jesus can pay off a hospital bill when you don't know if there's going to be a way. Jesus can be there whenever you think he's a million miles away. Just hearing a story from someone in the church that Jesus has made a difference will cause you to perk your head up and go, Devil, you ain't got no bullets in that gun. I, that's it, devil. I'm done with you. Part-time Christian. Oh. Somebody needs to write this down. Whoo, get ready. Part-time Christianity will not bring full-time deliverance. Don't be coming up in here on Sunday morning and going, whoo, I done got my dose of me some Jesus and go out there on Monday and, and talk like the world, act like the world, drink like the world, look at things like the world, act like the world, and then on Tuesday go, Jesus, I need deliverance. Jesus is going to look at you and say, yeah, you need deliverance from your sin. I'm going to let you get to a place where you do nothing but look at me. Jesus will not deliver you to make you happy. He'll deliver you as you become holy. Righteousness leads to deliverance. Righteousness leads to victory. Righteousness leads to overcoming. There's three things that you'll face in this world. Temptation. That is something that's trying to drive you backwards in your walk. That is something that is trying to take you to a place of sin. Temptation wants to destroy you. Then there is this idea of a trial. A trial is one of those things that's going to make you better, make you stronger. It's like working out. It's like being faced with something that, you know, gosh, this is going to have to, this is going to push me. That's a trial. It's to make you better. You want to know what testing is? Testing is seeing where you are with those two things. When you face a test, it's to see, okay, how are you handling that temptation? How are you handling that trial? Are you at a place where you can go to that next step? So today, you may be wounded. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. You may be depressed, but Jesus is the one that fills us full of joy. And I understand depression is hard. It's tough. It isn't easily overcome. It, it will grab a hold of you like a dark cloud, like a, like, a, like a demon, and hold on and won't let go. But can I tell you something? God's given people in this world the knowledge to help when it's medically necessary, and God's given the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver. Paul said, to live is to Christ and to die is to gain. In other words, he looked at life like this. If I'm going to live and I'm going to keep going, it's going to be for Jesus. And that's going to be okay. 
even though I might get beat again, thrown in prison, I might be left for dead, people may call me names, they may push me out of town, they may reject me, I'm going to live for Jesus. And that's going to be okay. And then he says, but to die is gain. And if I don't make it, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if I don't make it, I'm going to be with Jesus. So if I live, it's going to be about Jesus. And if I die, it's going to be about Jesus. If what's going on in my life brings life, great. If it brings death, great. It's going to be about Jesus. That was Paul's attitude. Paul faced so many things. But he understood Jesus was the overcomer. And that's what the church is built on. The church is not built on music. It's not built on the pastor. It's not built on how many people come into this room. It's not built on what it looks like. It is built on Jesus. As for Chicopee Baptist Church, it's built on Jesus and nothing else. It's not built to build my kingdom. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to step on somebody's toes. It's not being built to build your kingdom. It's being built to build Jesus' kingdom. Because that is what the church is built on. And to see the church any other way except for Jesus is to totally redefine the church as God intended it. God intends the church to be built on Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. The sweetest name I know. What must I do? How do we... How do we move from being overwhelmed to overcoming? Well, when I think about Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and the three things listed there, the cross, the confession, and the commitment, it was about Jesus. It's about realizing who He truly is. So we must look at Jesus differently. So my question is, where is your focus? Where is your focus? Is it more on the storm? Is it more on the rain? Or is it on Jesus? Because in the moments when you're overwhelmed, Jesus is there on the water to reach out a hand to pull you back up. When you feel like you cannot go any farther, think about the Psalms that says, The Lord is my strength. The Word of God will encourage us and the people of God will be there to support us. But it is Jesus that will get us through. We must look at Jesus differently. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was there when time began. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was nothing but a wasteland, a dung heap. It was a mess, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus was there when light was created, and it says in the Word of God that Jesus is the light. Without Jesus, there is no light. He hung the stars also. He created all that we know around us and we see and we become so numb to His creation. It doesn't mean a lot to us. Can I tell you something? Jesus left heaven and came to earth and lived as a baby. Grew up as a teenager and became a man. He walked around and He healed people. Those who were blind, He gave sight. Again, one man said, Jesus, Jesus, as Jesus was passing by. And he just wouldn't stop. The disciples would say, be quiet. Don't bother him. And you know what he would say? Jesus! He would holler even louder. And finally, Jesus said, bring him to me. He says, what can I do for you? And the man said, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Jesus healed the blind. He healed the lame. He raised people from the dead. One day dead. Three days dead. Four days dead. He even raised himself from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He planted a thing called the church and people who were misfits, who were uneducated, who didn't know anything, but God used them that's impacting the world today. And you think your problem is too big for him? Jesus is the overcomer. We need to see Him as the resurrected Christ over all things. 
then we'll see Jesus in light of our mess. Paul said, whether I live or whether I die, it's going to be about Him. The church, why church? Because it's the only place you'll hear the message that you can overcome through Jesus Christ. You won't hear that anywhere else. You can join a club, you can read a book, and it'll say, just think positive thoughts. Think positive thoughts. Make a list of goals. But when you leave Jesus out, you're right where the enemy wants you to be. In the perfect position for defeat. The enemy doesn't want to simply confuse your life. He wants to destroy it. But Jesus wants to build it up. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, there's victory in Jesus. We shall overcome. One day when we get to heaven, there will be no more sickness or pain or sorrow. There will be no more troubles. But in the meantime, God, you have chosen the church to be the place where we get to practice for heaven. We get to experience a little heaven on earth. Lord, this Christian life that you've called us to was never intended in the New Testament. Nowhere is it intended to be lived alone. To be isolated from the church is to disregard Jesus Christ himself as useless. For your word says that Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body. And to disregard the rest of his body, that's just disgusting. Father, today I pray your Holy Spirit convicts hearts to understand the importance of being together with God's people. But even more so, may the Holy Spirit move on somebody's heart to change their view of Jesus. This is not a religion. This is about a relationship. I don't know what God's doing in your heart right now, but will you do business with the Lord right now? Father, we need to do something with this message today. What is it that you want me to do? In Jesus' name, amen.